It's very easy for people today to accept Jesus as our Savior. Everyone wants that. At least all of those who believe God, believe the Bible, believe Jesus, even if it is a surface belief, they still want Jesus as their Savior. That's, that aspect is fairly easy. But many of the songs that we sing this morning deals with the aspect of Jesus being our Lord. That's a whole lot more difficult to accept than the aspect of Jesus being our Savior. But in reality, if Jesus is not Lord, then he's not going to be our Savior. He must be our Lord in order to be our Savior from a personal standpoint. If I do not make Jesus Lord of my life, then he's not going to be Savior of my life. Same is true with you and with each one. And so while we like that aspect of Jesus being a Savior, Jesus being a Lord, that's another matter. It's a lot more difficult. The word Lord, as used in the original Greek, comes from the Greek word kurios. As this word is defined by various lexicons, Thayer says, quote, He to whom a person or thing belongs, about which he has power of deciding, master or Lord, end quote. William Barclay in his commentary, uses uh, this t uh, description of uh, the term Lord. Quote, describes someone who has undisputed possession of a person or thing. It means master or, own or owner in the most definite sense, end quote. Thus, you're dealing with Jesus, in this case, being our Lord, being our absolute ruler, our master in every aspect of our life, that we belong to him. And he has the power, he has the right of deciding well, you could stop it there. He has the power of right deciding in relationship to our life. And that means every single aspect of our life. But when we bring it down to that aspect, that's really where we all have a problem, though, isn't it? Because how many of us really want to turn our life over to anyone or anything or any, any being. We want to control our life. One of the reasons that communism is rebelled against by the people is because they lose that control. You see that also in socialism they eventually lose that control. And so they start rebelling against it. Why? Because we want control of our life. That was one of the things that made capitalism in our nation so successful. We did what we want to do. We controlled our own life. We controlled our own, in that sense, destiny. And we kept the government out of it. And we became successful as a nation. Why? Because people controlled their own life. When it comes down to individuals, we, I mean, we're all that way. I don't want so-and-so over here telling me what to do. No, it, just kind of, it just doesn't feel right for someone to tell me what to do. I want to control my own life. I want to do what I want to do. In fact, I want, that's the very nature of it. It's my desires, my will, my wants, 
I'm in control of me. As you look at the New Testament and the life of Christ, <clears throat> this isn't a problem that arose just with our, na our generation. The apostles of our Lord had the same problem. They wanted control. And they, <clears throat> they often became embroiled in a controversy among themselves as to who would be the greatest among them. For example, in Mark, the ninth chapter, and this is just a couple of the illustrations that I want to use, but uh, of numerous occasions. But in Mark 9, in verse 33 through verse 35, it says that he came to Capernaum, and being in the, out, in the house, he asked them, What was it that ye disputed among yourselves by the way? But they held their peace, for by the way they had disputed among themselves who should be the greatest. And he sat down and called the twelve and said unto them, If any man desire to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. They wanted greatness. They, and the greatness that we see that they are discussing is the power over the others. I want to be greater than the other apostles over there. Make me the first. In the very next chapter of Mark chapter 10 starting in verse 35 you see this that <coughs> and James and John the sons of Zebedee come unto him saying master we would that thou do for us whatsoever we desire notice that whatsoever we desire it wasn't what God wanted it wasn't what Jesus was setting forth we want you to do what we want why? Because they had the same problem that we have. But go on with it. He said unto them, What would ye that I should do for you? And they say unto him, Grant unto us that we may sit, one on thy right hand and the other on thy left, in thy glory. Now what were they asking? Well, the right hand was the first-hand man. The person on the left was the second one. And so you would have, in this sense, a king, and then the next one under the king would be the one sitting on his right hand, and the next one would be the one sitting on the left hand. They wanted power. They wanted control of all the others. Everyone else then would be in subjection to those individuals. And thus, the statement in chapter 9, they were arguing about who's going to be the greatest. And so here's James and John coming to Jesus. Let us be the ones. Put us on your right hand and on your left hand. Now, of course, he says, uh, his response, ye know not what ye ask. Can you drink of the cup that I drink of and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And they said, we can. Just as an aside here. They had no idea at that time what they were saying. <laughs> Not in reality. They didn't realize what was going to be coming as far as Jesus and his death upon the cross. They had no concept at that time of the New Testament and the persecution that they would have to undergo and endure during the New Testament times. So while they said we can, you know, sometimes it's a good thing to stop before you ask for something or say that you can do something because you might not realize what all is involved in it. But Jesus said unto them, Ye shall in indeed drink of the cup that I drink of, and, be, and with the baptism I am baptized with all, shall ye be baptized? By the way, the baptism that he's talking about here is not water baptism. Instead, it is a baptism of suffering. He was going to suffer on the cross. There's that baptism. And they were going to suffer as being his followers. You're going to drink of that. I'm sure that when he said this, they still had no concept as to what he was really talking about. 
But Jesus goes on, but to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared. Who it had been prepared for? Well, the right hand had been prepared for those who would enter into heaven. The left hand had been prepared for those who would go into eternal torment. Now, and think about what they'd just ask. <laughs> think they were really asking for that? No, they were asking for their power, for the authority, to be the ones in control of everything. But now then notice, when the ten heard it, they became or began to be much displeased with James and John. Now why? Think back to chapter 9. They were disputing about this very thing, and here's these two coming to Jesus, kind of almost behind the back of the others without their knowledge and trying to get those places of greatness. And so they're kind of upset now with James and John. So what does Jesus do? He calls them to him and says to them, You know that they which are accounted to rule over the Gentiles exercise, now notice this word, lordship over them. And their great ones exercise authority upon them. But it shall not be so among you. But whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister, and whosoever among you will be the chiefest shall be the servant of all. For even the Son of Man came not to minister unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. They didn't understand the concept that Jesus had been teaching them throughout his ministry. And they continued to argue about this. And you remember, there on uh, that last night, when uh, in that supper Jesus takes a towel and he starts washing their feet. Now, why did Jesus do that? Well, he says, I've given you an example. You don't know what I've, I'm doing at this time. Well, did they know that he was washing their feet? They weren't that stupid. They knew what he was doing physically, but they didn't understand it because they still didn't understand this attitude that Jesus was trying to teach them of servitude. And that's the example that he is setting forth for them, not the physical washing of feet that some have tried to bind through the years. He's trying to teach them this principle. Yes, the Gentiles exercise lordship. Those who are great exercise authority over others. Well, Jesus was the Lord and Master, but... They wanted that type of authority. They are the ones who wanted to control things. They realized, yes, Jesus is Lord, but we want to be lesser lords. We want to be lords under you, right hand and left hand. And so this problem of the lordship and who's in control, even among the apostles, we see this. And this is just two illustrations of numerous and occasions during the life of Jesus. There is, though, the recognition of who is in control. Probably driving down the road, we've all seen at one time or another the old bumper sticker that says, Jesus is my co-pilot. I see a lot of you smiling, so you've seen that, obviously. And some shaking their head no, because that's right. It should not be that. Jesus is supposed to be our pilot, not our co-pilot. The song that we sing sometimes, I should have told you to lead this one, Jesus, Savior, pilot me. That's the aspect that we need to learn. But we want to take Jesus out of that pilot seat and put him in the co-pilot seat with us being the pilot. Thus, Jesus is my co-pilot, not my pilot. That's the recognition, though, as to who is in control. Jesus is that one who is Lord. The Scriptures confidently affirm that. 
In Ephesians 4 and verse 5, of course, it says one Lord, one faith, one baptism. There's one Lord. That is our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In Matthew, the 23rd chapter, is Jesus severely rebukes these scribes and Pharisees, condemns them in no uncertain terms. He tells the people, Be ye not called rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. And call, call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. You see, here's all of these rabbis and such. They wanted that title of greatness. They wanted that authority over everyone else. And Jesus' point is, you're all brethren. One should not be elevating himself above others. Now, yes, this certainly condemns the use of religious titles. Of course, it's not wrong to call an earthly father from a physical sense father. He is dealing with it from a religious title sense. They were using these titles to elevate themselves above everyone else. And we thus have authority over you. Remember the debate that we watched uh, with the, between Brother Brown and David Callum? And the aspect of that religious title. And through the years, you know, you go to the magisterium and to the priest, and he would tell you what it means, the scripture means. Why? Because we are above you. You can't think for yourself. You can't study for yourself. You can't learn for yourself. Even if you think you have, you still need to go to the priest and let him tell you what it actually means, whether it means that or not. Why? Because they are ones who are over you. There's that aspect that Jesus is condemning here. But notice what he says in relationship to call be not called rabbi for one is your master, and that's Christ. He's the one who is Lord. He's the one who has that right, that power to rule our lives. In Acts, the second chapter then, after Jesus has been crucified, he's been raised from the dead, He's now ascended back to his father to sit down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Peter is now opening the key, the keys to, or using the keys to open the church, the kingdom of God, to those who will be submissive to the will of God. But as he con concludes that sermon in setting forth the exaltation of Christ, and that it did not, and that the scriptures did not refer to David because David was still in the grave. But God had raised Jesus from the grave, showed him openly. And now then he's gone into heaven itself. But notice verse 36 when he says, Therefore, this is the conclusion of everything that he's been saying. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Peter is preaching now the lordship of Jesus. Whether Peter realized it or not, Certainly, I don't believe the Jews realized it at this point. They considered Jesus to be Lord of the Jews, not necessarily the Lord of all. And thus, when we come later on to Acts the 10th chapter, some say about 10 years later, there's a miracle that has to be performed in relationship to Peter to teach him that God is not a respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted of him. But as 
Peter now is speaking to the house of Cornelius. He says the word in verse 36, the word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. Now notice this. He is Lord of all. The Jews considered Christianity for the Jews, not for the world, not for the Gentiles. That's when Peter comes back to the Jews and they call him on the carpet for going to the Gentiles. And after he goes through and rehearses all of the events that took place, well, then God has offered salvation to the Gentiles as well. Peter had learned Jesus was Lord not just of the Jews, but of all. Our Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 5 then, Paul would say, For we preach not ourselves, but Jesus Christ the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus Christ, or for Jesus' sake. The American Standard has that instead of, but Jesus Christ, the Lord, they, it has it, but Jesus Christ as Lord. Either way, it deals with the same idea, that Jesus Christ is the one who is the Lord. There's an interesting statement that Jesus makes in the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew the 6th chapter, and verse 24, when he says that no man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. There's been a lot of definitions and ideas as to what is mammon. Some have thought it means Satan. Well, no, it doesn't mean Satan. It does mean riches or treasure. But it's dealing with that in which one trusts. Yes, it denotes earthly goods. But it's always stressing their materialistic character. And thus the idea that we trust in those materialistic goods, those materialistic treasures. And Jesus is saying, you cannot hold to God and trust in material things. Trust in the material riches, goods, whatever it might be. It's an impossibility. And yet, look at the way in which we live today. How many of us, in reality, really trust in our riches, trust in all of the things that we have, all of our goods? And we place our trust there instead of trusting in God. And we see this specifically, or more to the point, as you study 1 Corinthians first chapter, how that the rich are not going to obey the gospel, generally speaking. Why? Because they trust in their material wealth. But that doesn't exclude the, the poor in this regard either. The poor or the rich, either one, can trust in that which is of a material nature can trust in their own things instead of placing their trust in God. And Jesus is saying, you cannot do that. It is impossible to trust in things and to trust in God at one and the same time. And if you remember so many times during the Old Testament times, Israel trusted in various things, instead of placing their trust in God. Think about the uh, period of the judges, that entire period. When they became rich, they thought they didn't have need of God, and thus they apostatized, and God would send them a oppressing nation over them. And when they finally realized they couldn't trust in their material wealth, they started placing their trust in God and 
asking God to deliver them, whereupon he would send a deliverer, a judge, to deliver them. And then you would start that cycle over as they became rich again. What happened? They forgot God because they trusted in the material wealth. Notice the times in which prophets speak. So many times Israel is running to this nation or that nation for help. Why? Because they trusted in material things, whether it be the number of horses and warriors and military might or the wealth of this nation of that, or that nation to come and help us instead of placing their trust in God. We might not do it from that standpoint, but how many times do we do it within our lives? This really boils down to within our own mind, who's in control. If you will, there's a throne in our mind, and who's seated on that throne? Is Jesus the one who's seated on that throne and we are bowing down to him and to his will or do we remove Jesus from our throne and we place self on throne and make Jesus bow down to us? How many times is it what we want, what I want, instead of what God wants? A great illustration of that in history uh, of the Lord's church here in the latter part of the 18th, 19th, 20th, and 21st century. Instrumental music. Why did some individuals start bringing the instrument into the worship? And we see that in congregations of the Lord's church today. Why? Because we want it. It's what we like. It was their will, and we're going to make God subservient to our will. Instead of, thy will be done. And whatever it says, doesn't matter what it says, whatever God says, that's what it's going to be. Whether I like it or not no matter what I think about it or not. We fight so much with the denominational world over baptism. And is it for the remission of sins? Is it necessary to be saved? Why should it even be a problem? The problem is, I don't want to do it. That's really where it boils down to. And I'm going to be the one who controls it. And I'm going to put God on, or I'm going to take God off of the throne in my mind. And I'm going to be there. And God is going to have to be subservient to and going to have to be pleased with what I want. Isn't that the idea that has been presented in newspapers through the years, decades? Find the church of... Not God's choice, but your choice. Why? Because you're the one in control and not God. The only way to be pleasing to God, though, is to recognize the lordship of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that means in every aspect of our life. Not only in coming together to worship our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as we are authorized to do and mandated to do, but also when we leave this building and we go out into the world and we talk with our friends, that speech is to be as the oracles of God. For example, 1 Peter 4 and verse 11. Are we letting God control our speech? As we dress, our dress is to be under the control of God. Am I dressing as God would have me to dress? As I speak, am I using the speech that God would have me use? 
as I live my life, the actions that I take, is that God being in control of my life, or have I removed God and I'm going to do what I want to do? That really is what Christianity is all about. Now then, if you have not humbly submitted yourself to the will of the Father today, and allowed truly Christ to be Lord of your life, then why not obey His will in becoming baptized upon your faith and repenting of your sins? Repentance, that's really what we've been talking about to a great extent. In removing self and putting God on the throne, or Christ on the throne. Repenting of your sins, making a confession of your faith in Jesus Christ as the Son of God, letting us baptize you in water for the forgiveness of your sins. Why? Because Jesus our Lord said that's what you do. If you, as a Christian you have removed Christ from the throne of your mind and you've placed yourself there and you're living for, you're acting as your going through your own will instead of the Father's will or Christ's will within your life, then why not repent of your sins and let us pray with you for the forgiveness of them? If you need to come, then why not do so as we stand and sing the invitation song?